Today, I want to talk to you about dreams. Dreams have fascinated humans for millennia. In fact, we can find hieroglyphs with dreams in caves thousands of years ago. People have been thinking about dreams forever as meaningful, as part of their lives. A lot of the discoveries of our times are owed to dreams. Einstein reported having dreams that allowed him to come up with the ideas that he called the happiest thought in his life, the ideas of general relativity. And there are many, many more. And in fact, you don't have to go far into others. You all experience dreams that you woke up from and said, oh my God, this is so meaningful, I gotta tell someone. We actually also have responses to dreams of others as if they are the outcome of their decisions. Think about uh, you and your uh, spouse waking up uh, from a night in bed and you tell her, oh, you know, I had a great dream about my ex-girlfriend. She would be upset with you in the real world. She wouldn't say, well, it's a movie that your brain created and you just had the experience and I'm interested in knowing more about it. She would think that if you dreamt about your ex-girlfriend, there must be something that you're desiring in your dreams. So we are all somehow feeling that we're responsible for our dreams, that whatever happens in the dreams manifests our lives. Yet, for a long time, people didn't really have access to their dreams. All they had access to was the stories that we tell when we wake up. So today I want to explain to you what we know about dreams. There are six theories and I'm going to list them quickly and also what it tells us about how we can control the dreams in the future and actually use them for our own advantage. So let's start with uh, something that will be difficult for a lot of people and that is the understanding that the story you tell when you wake up about your dream might not be true. Memories we have of our dreams are tainted and colored by our awake self. The things we say when we wake up about our dreams are our way of taking whatever memory we have in our mind when we wake up and putting that into a narrative. And there are many examples of times where people actually made up a story that we know is not true because their awake self was involved. First of all, we know that the kids only talk about dreams in language that they know. They only dream about things that they recognize. We know that adults that have all kinds of disorders, like ones who are unable to see faces, for instance, saying that they don't see faces in their dreams. People that are blind say that there's no visual in their dream, only sounds. And so we know that what you experience in the awake world is somehow connected to what you dream. We also know that people think of their dreams like movies and interpret them as such. In the 1920s, where movies were in black and white, most people reported their dreams as black and white movies. And at some point, 10 years after, when movies started having colors in them, everyone started saying that their dreams were in color. Why? The dreams didn't change, but what we think of as a movie changed, and people think dreams are like a movie in my mind, so I guess my dreams were also in color. So in that sense, one thing we know is that the story you tell about your dreams when you wake up might not be fully accurate. It probably is not entirely made up, but it's somehow tainted by your language when you awoken. And the reason it's important is because for the last 100 years, most dream therapies were actually reliant on stories you tell when you're awake. Think of Freud or Carl Jung, all of those fantastic researchers who tried to interpret dreams. What they did was ask a patient to wake up and tell them a story. And if we now know that the story that you tell might not be true, it means that Freud's interpretation of dreams was most interpretation of the person's awake experience and how they think of their dreams. Freud didn't have access to people's dreams. He just had access to the story you tell when you're awake. But in the last 10 years, neuroscientists are finally able to look into the brain of a dreaming person and see the dreams in visuals when they're still asleep. So we can actually see the dream and they make you up and ask you to tell a story and see how similar your story is to the dream that we've seen and where are the gaps and why there are those gaps. So suddenly we have access to dreams in reality and we can finally start interpreting them and understanding what they mean. So today I wanna tell you about the six theories that neuroscientists argue are the explanation to what dreams are for. There are three that you're gonna hate and three that you're gonna love and one that is mine. So of course, that's the correct one. Let's start with the one that's most annoying and that is the dreams don't exist. Some scientists say that we don't dream at all. We just don't have this thing. We just wake up with a thought in our mind and we immediately craft a story around this thought and think that this was our dream because our brain is unable to stay with a memory without any reason for it, so it comes up with a story. This experiment that kind of led to this theory looked something like that. People are sleeping in the lab and then a scientist comes and bangs the symbol right next to their ears and then hides them so the person wakes up 
from like a huge, very, very uh, salient sound. And the scientist asked the person, quick, tell me what your dreams were. And the person typically tells a story that looks something like that. I was walking in the street comfortably, and suddenly I heard an explosion. So far it makes sense. The symbol makes them think of an explosion. But what happens next is weird, because the person then says, so I looked to my left, and I saw a house that totally collapsed. So I ran to the house, and I found a little baby there, and I saved the baby, and I ran out. But then I saw a little puppy there, and I came back, and I saved the puppy. People tell an entire story, all of which did not happen, just because they woke up with the sound of an explosion in their mind, and their brain needed to fill the gap and make up a story. If this theory is true, then we don't really dream. We just wake up with some fraction of a memory and we fill the gaps to tell an entire story that helps us make meaning and sense of this thing. We don't like this theory at all because it means that dreams don't exist and we have nothing to do with them. So let's move on. The second theory is also unpleasant but has a little bit more uh, bearing in some research. And that's a theory that's essentially made up by a guy called Alan Obson that says the dreams exist, they just don't mean anything. If you know anything about computers, there's this thing on a hard drive called defragment, where every now and then the computer needs to essentially organize itself differently, so all the files that are fragmented into pieces are becoming one, and the files are just in one piece. It makes your memory, uh, in your computer memory, work faster and be more efficient, and memory computers do it occasionally to just organize themselves better. The idea of Hobson is that memories are the same. Throughout our life, we put memories in different parts of the brain, and they're scattered all over, and every now and then, the brain needs to organize them. The time to do that is when we're sleeping. In a stage of the sleep called REM, the brain picks up all the pieces and tries to move them into one location and make order out of them. And what we see are things, memories, moving around, and our brain just makes them into a narrative. My mom, my dad, the ocean, the Big Ben. I guess we were together in a family trip to the London uh, Big Ben. That's how we make sense of a really meaningless information. We just move memories around, and the brain makes them into a story. Still not a pleasant theory, but at least this one has some bearing. We can see overnight how memories are being moved, and we can see how people make stories that align with those memories being moved, and now you can explain at least how the stories emerge and what is the prompt for them. Here's a third theory that also says that dreams don't really mean anything in and of themselves, but at least the function of dreaming means something. That's a theory that came up only two years ago and suggests that dreaming is the brain's way of protecting the real estate of visuals. So here's what I mean by that. When you're dreaming, you get no inputs into the eyes. The eyes are shut, and you get no input for the real world. So a part of your brain in the back, that is the part that's supposed to process visual information, isn't active. It just sits there waiting. When you wake up, it's going to get feed from the eyes again, and it's going to get a lot of rich information. But when you're asleep for seven hours, there's just no input into this part. It sits there and gets no information. Well, the brain doesn't like to be in a state where there's no information. So whenever there's no activity, other parts start to take over. And the theory that came out two years ago suggests that dreams are a way for this part of the brain to essentially create fake imagery, just to keep working and make sure that other parts won't take over. To give you a sense of that, if a person is born blind, they get no information into the visual part of the brain, they never see anything. What often happens is that in the first years of their life, the auditory parts of the brain are gradually taking over and they become much better in hearing because a lot more of the real estate of the brain is being used for hearing, but of course they never use this part for seeing because there's just no input from the eyes. Well, this little thing could happen to all of us every night, that absent any input, our brain will just give parts of it to other modules and we'll lose the ability to see the day after. To protect this part, the brain creates fake images as if they come from the eyes just to keep us active and protect this part, and this is what we call dreams visuals that emerge in the brain spontaneously just to keep the brain working and avoid letting other modules in the brain take over. So three theories that all suggest the same idea. Dreams don't mean anything. There are just ways for the brain to do things that help us uh, protect it, move things around, or even just make a story, but the dreams themselves mean nothing and they don't exist. Now let's go to the other three that actually say the dream means something. The first and the second one in this category say the opposite things. One by a very famous neuroscientist called Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize in 1953 for discovering the double helix, DNA, suggests that dreams are our way to forget. The brain has lots of memories that were created during the day, 
And at some point during the night, it needs to choose which ones to keep, which ones to get rid of. There's just too many things that you've been through today, not all of them can be kept there. So the brain looks at the category of all the memories and say, very important, not too important, very important, very, very important, we'll keep this one, delete those two. For that, the brain has to stay in the state where it kind of goes back to the movies of the past and tries to look at them from different lens and different angle and decide how important are they for the future. In that sense, dreams are made for forgetting. It's the way our brain goes back into events of the last 24 hours, 48 hours, and sees them from a different light and chooses whether they should stay with us in the future or get rid of them entirely by pruning the cells that connect to them. There's some evidence for this that I'm gonna tell you in a second. I'll just say quickly that the counter theory is exactly the opposite. That when you go through the night in all experiences, you aren't forgetting, you're actually strengthening the positive ones. So theory number four, if you want, from the four that I just mentioned, is that we're dreaming to forget, and five is the dream to actually strengthen the memories that we've been through, so we'll use them more. It's almost the same. If you erase this or strengthen that, you're going through a sim similar process, it's just where you put your focus. How do we know that there's something about that that's true? There was a really nice work by a colleague of mine from Harvard, uh, Bob Stickgold, where he actually showed that you can activate memories in the brains of people that are sleeping if you make them do things when they're awake the day before, even if they themselves don't remember the experience. What he did is he took people with amnesia and had them play Tetris. This is something that was done back in the early 2000s. They played Tetris for hours. When they're awake, they were playing and they were getting better and better in, in, in playing Tetris, and then they were sent to sleep. Most people, when they woke up in the morning, reported having dreams about something that has to do with Tetris. I was dreaming of falling bricks that land on me, or I was running in a maze and there were things I had to move between and change them and shape them. Most people reported something that had to do with the experience from the day before. Only that those people have amnesia. They didn't know what happened the day before. If you ask them, what did you do yesterday? They had no idea. They didn't say, I played Tetris for the entire day. It kind of makes sense. They just said, I have no idea what I did yesterday, but I do know that I dreamt about falling bricks. In that sense, the dreams are their brain's way of looking at the past, even if other parts of the brain, the memory parts, don't know what the past was. And now comes the most important theory. The one that I would call the VR theory, the virtual reality. And this one suggests that dreams are our brain's way not to look at the past, but think about the future. Dreams are our brain's way of simulating things we haven't seen yet and preparing us for them. You're thinking of whether you should uh, start a new business and move to Alabama or marry your boyfriend and together start a family and you have debating between those two options. You really don't know. Should I move to Alabama and start a business or should I stay in New York and marry my boyfriend? What should I do? You're battling this all day long and then you go to sleep. Overnight, your brain creates a movie for you and simulates both futures. Movie one is you in Alabama building a nice building, putting all the machines in the, and becoming a chef. All the things you had in mind happen in Alabama. And because the dreams are like a movie that you're the star in, they feel real. You actually go through the experience of how it would be in Alabama. What would be the taste and the smell and the temperature? How would I feel doing that? The dreams are filtered to your emotions and you actually go through the experience. So when you wake up, even though you forget the dreams itself, you don't remember what you've been through, the feelings are still there. So when you have to make a choice, you say, you know, thinking about it more, I think I should take the Alabama thing. Of course, a different dream will give you the experience of moving with your boyfriend and having a kid, and you will see how this feels, and you will have two competing scenarios that you would go through and then make a choice that's a little more informed. As if you've been to the parenting experience or to the business experience. So dreams take things that are in our mind when we are awake, create experiences for us that simulate them and allow us to filter them to our emotions so even if we forget them, we know better what we want to do. The nice thing about that is it means that dreams are actually meaningful for us and we should spend time pondering upon them. And the nice thing about that is that neuroscientists now are giving us tools to do just that. In the last 10 years, we've been able to look at the brains of dreaming people and see the visuals and see the experiences that they go through so that we can actually create some kind of record of the dream. And when they wake up, even if they forgot the entire experience, we can tell them, you know, we think that uh, in your dream, you've been in a place that you're unfamiliar with, with people that you don't know, and you are working. And you will say, yes, I'm actually thinking about moving to Alabama and starting a business. What is the experience that you have right now feeling wise when you hear about this thing and how can you use it to make better choices? In that sense, the VR dream experience 
is a fantastic experience because it means that we can start helping you navigate your dreams to things that you care about. If you say, you know, I really think that I want to do something, but I don't have the courage, we can help you in all kinds of ways, have a dream that will take you into this place so you will really go through this experience and know if it's good for you and if you're willing to gamble on that. In a future video, we're going to explain exactly how we can change dreams, manipulate them, even activate them, and how this could actually be useful for a lot of you as the ultimate VR experience. Something that allows you to go to sleep, ask for a dream, and go through an enchanting, fantastic experience that's on demand. Stay with us for another video.